Good morning and welcome to chapter 11. Chapter 11 is uh, week 11, the week 11 meteorology video on hurricanes. Okay, so um, this particular topic on hurricanes is available in both the 7th and 8th editions of the Essentials of Meteorology and Invitation to the Atmosphere textbooks. <clears throat> okay, so let's start talking about tropical weather to kind of set the tone for the discussion on hurricanes for this lesson. Uh, tropics are generally a broad belt around the earth and they're generally the tropics generally uh, range from about 23 and a half degrees north latitude the tropic of cancer to 23 and a half degrees south latitude the tropic of capricorn so between 23 and a half degrees north and 23 and a half degrees south latitude we generally consider those areas the tropical areas uh, weather is much different much different than middle latitudes in the tropics the uh, noon sun is always high in the sky you know, in the middle latitudes, the noon sun varies in altitude and even azimuth, the direction in the sky, from season to season. But in the tropics, that noon sun is most directly overhead, high in the sky. The seasonal temperatures changes are very small. And I can give you an example of this. You know, I had visited uh, the Marianas Islands before out in the western Pacific Ocean, and uh, they're, they're not very far north of the equator. Um, literally, the average high is about 87 degrees Fahrenheit, 88 degrees Fahrenheit, and the average low is about 84. There's only like a 4 degree Fahrenheit difference between the high and low, and it pretty much is the same all throughout the year <clears throat> in a location such as Guam in the tropical area. Um, daily heating and humidity favor cumulus cloud development and afternoon thunderstorms in the tropics. And we really should not be surprised by this, being that the sun's heating is so direct and more intense. Um, you have a lot of warm ocean waters in the tropical areas, so you've got a lot of moisture and instability with the heat, the more direct heating or radiation from the sun. Now, systems in the tropics, there's usually non-squall clusters, uh, there could be squall lines. There's streamlines and tropical waves. Okay, so for streamlines, I, I want you to think of this. Uh, we do not use isobars in the tropics. Uh, isobars, if you remember from a previous lesson, refer to lines of equal barometric pressure. But instead, we use streamlines in the tropics. And streamlines are generally going to be used because there's just very little pressure change. The barometric pressure doesn't change a whole lot in the tropics, with the exception of tropical systems such as tropical storms or hurricanes. That will drastically change the pressure field. But overall, streamlines are used in place of isobars. Uh, streamlines generally depict the wind directions in the tropical latitudes. Here is an example of uh, what we call an easterly wave, okay? This is one of the features in the tropics. The green dashed line indicates the axis, the axis of the trough or the area of lower pressure in association with this easterly wave. And typically on the west side to the left, to the left of that green dashed line or to the west side, you typically have an area of divergence and to the east side of a tropical easterly wave, you have an area of convergence where air is coming together and rising, producing clouds and precipitation. So to the east of the easterly waves, you typically have your rain shower activity, very showery in nature, possible thunderstorms over the warmer waters of the tropics, while to the west or to the left of this green dashed trough axis, the, the easterly wave trough axis, to the west, you have upper, yeah, basically divergence or sinking air motion in nicer weather. All right, so the anatomy of a hurricane. These are very interesting systems. A uh, hurricane is generally a heat engine in the atmosphere. Intense. Uh, the, in, bottom line is a hurricane is an intense storm of tropical origin. The winds are greater than 64 knots, and there's different names according to the region they occur. For example west of the 180 degree west longitude line, the international date line, 
west of 180 degrees longitude. These are known as typhoons. Typhoon literally translates to mean great wind. In the Indian Ocean area, you know, around Australia, into right outside of the uh, continent of India, you typically have what's known, we call hurricane cyclones, just cyclones. Or we can call them tropical cyclones, which we are most familiar with in the eastern North Pacific Ocean, as well as in the North Atlantic Ocean. All right, and, and these systems feature both an eye and an eye wall, okay? And the eye is generally the area of a hurricane where, or a tropical cyclone, where the air is sinking. In the eye, the air is sinking. We generally have clear to partly cloudy skies as a result. As the air sinks, it dries and it warms as it's compressed. The eye wall is the area immediately surrounding the eye in which we have the heaviest rainfall and the strongest, most gusty winds occur in the eye wall. So there are a couple features, uh, major features with hurricanes. Here's the anatomy of a hurricane as it would look on a satellite image. Notice at the center of the storm, there is that clear to partly cloudy area known as the eye. And what is interesting about the eye it has very light winds, believe it or not. You have really strong winds, especially in the eye wall. That's like, that again is where you have the strongest winds with the hurricane. Um, but the eye itself is a very calm area. Um, people have mistakenly gone outside after one side of the storm passes, thinking the storm was over uh, when the eye was overhead, just to have the winds shift direction as the hurricane moved on and the weather got just as bad on the other side of the storm. So it has happened before where people have gone outside thinking the storm was over um, whenever the eye passed overhead. Now, the eye also is the area of the lowest barometric pressure associated with the hurricane. Right? Then you have the eye wall that immediately surrounds the eye. And this is a um, very um, intense area of a hurricane, the eye wall. This is where the thunderstorms grow to their greatest heights. The precipitation, the rain is at its heaviest. And uh, you can really get some uh, very bad destruction when you have an eye wall go over an area. And that was just recently, um, you know, we talk about some past hurricanes, Hurricane Katrina back in 2005, and then we just recently had Hurricane Michael. You know, Hurricane Michael in 2018 as it went into the Florida Panhandle and intensified rapidly over the warmer Gulf, uh, Gulf of Mexico waters before it made landfall. And we have also spiral rain bands associated with the anatomy of a hurricane, and those are generally kind of spread out away from the center. Um, if you experience weather with a spiral rain band, you typically get these strong, gusty winds and very heavy downpours really fast. The, the precipitation, the rain will come down really hard and then stops really quickly. It might start up again really quickly. We call that squally tropical weather when you have the rain bands. Uh, you might get a little bit of gusty winds with those rain bands as well. And then there's a rain-free area further outward away from the center. Here is a uh, three-dimensional view of how the air flows within this giant heat engine known as a hurricane. Uh, if you look at the center, the eye, that's where your air is. Again, it's sinking in the eye. Uh, as a result, you generally have clear to partly cloudy area in the eye. And then you got um, some strong inflow where the air is coming in, spinning. Keep in mind that with a hurricane, it's a cyclone. So in the northern hemisphere, your winds are going to blow counterclockwise and inward toward the eye itself. But the inflow area is all those low level winds closer to the surface that get blown into and wrapped around the center of the cyclone, the hurricane itself. <clears throat> and then importantly aloft, there is an area of outflow aloft where if you were looking at a satellite image of a hurricane, you would see these wispy cirrus clouds, these high wispy ice crystal clouds over the top. Um, it's a giant ventilating exhaust system over the top of a hurricane. Uh, what's happening is it's removing all that mass aloft. You typically want high pressure aloft over a hurricane to allow for that outflow of excess mass and removal of that mass. Whereas you have the lower pressure the, associated with the hurricane itself at the surface. All right, and here is what a, uh, this is a uh, 
tr uh, the rainfall rate associated with a hurricane if we were to dissect it. Um, generally, you have the eye at the center of the system again. You're not really going to have any rain associated with the eye because the air is sinking. It's drying out. It's warming. It's compressing. Uh, you do have some the heaviest rainfall is going to be, in this case, the heaviest rain rate is associated with the eye wall, which is that area immediately surrounding the eye itself is the eye wall. And then you get uh, more heavier rain bands, um, more heavier rain associated with those rain bands that I mentioned where you get the rain will start really quick and it'll be a big downpour. The next minute the rain stops. All right. So this is typical of a hurricane, the general precipitation coverage within it. So for hurricane formation and dissipation, well, it's the time to start talking about how these things come together. Uh, we need the right environment. So what does that mean? Hurricane formation is favored in tropical waters with light winds, high humidity, and warm surface water temperatures. You want surface, warm surface water temperatures are going to be key because these are the warm surface water is the key energy source for a hurricane to form and to maintain its intensity. Um, the developing storm, clusters of thunderstorms are on a central area of surface low pressure. So you initially need a low level disturbance or area of low pressure at the surface. Um, you want those light wind areas. Uh, you don't want a lot of wind shear. We talked about wind shear the last unit where there's a lot of uh, change in wind speed direction, wind speed and direction with height with wind shear. You don't want a lot of that. You want lighter winds so you can get these strong updrafts over the warm tropical waters. You want that nice high pressure aloft where you get the outflow or removal of mass over the top of the storm. You definitely want an area with high humidity. Um, and what happens is, especially with the storms out off the coast of Africa that try to develop, what sometimes happens is you get this dry air from the desert and that gets wrapped into the, you get that dry air which is wrapped into the circulation of a low pressure system over the tropical waters. And what it does is it will choke off the updrafts and basically evaporate the moisture. So that's why you want high humidity. Now there is something, uh, once you get that cluster of thunderstorms developed around a central area of surface low pressure, there's something also known as eye wall replacement. I did a little research on this and it's a real interesting topic. Um, there's something known as an eye wall replacement cycle that goes with the eye wall replacement. So what happens with the eye wall replacement or eye wall replacement cycle, they're the same thing, is your outer eye wall, your inner eye wall will dissipate. Okay, so you may have one inner eye wall initially. But what happens is there's a formation of an, another eye wall, but it's further out away from the eye. And what happens during the eye wall replacement cycle is the hurricane temporarily loses intensity. It, it weakens a little bit during the eye wall replacement cycle because all the excess energy, that new eye wall, is basically robbing or taking energy from the inner eye wall. And eventually that outer eye wall will come in and contract toward the center of the storm, the eye, and that will become the uh, primary eye wall. But in the process of kind of taking the energy from the inner eye wall, the outer eye wall moves in and there's a temporary weakening of the storm. So that is a very important topic because when these systems get ready to make landfall, we need to know if it's an eye wall replacement cycle or is the eye wall replacement cycle complete? If the eye wall, uh, eye wall replacement cycle is complete, then that hurricane will have a much stronger potential before it makes landfall. But if it's making landfall during an eye wall replacement cycle, then there's a chance it may weaken somewhat, which hopefully that will be a little bit more of a saving grace for those in its path. Moving on to the next slide, we're looking at hurricane formation and dissipation. On the y-axis there on the left-hand side, vertical column, we have number of storms per 100 years, and we have on the bottom, the x-axis, the dates. A hurricane season in the northern hemisphere runs from June 1st to November 30th. Okay, and look at the spike in the center of this diagram. The peak of hurricane season in the North Atlantic Ocean is typically around September 11th. And so you can see um, in May, especially the beginning of the hurricane season, June 1st, June 20th, July 10th, 
really um, the average number of storms per 100 years is only about 5 to 10. Not very high, but bo boy, once you get to the uh, August, late August, and all the way through uh, mid-September, that's when the frequency of storms really rises or increases. Um, by September 10th, 11th, uh, we've had 90 storms over the last 100 years occur around September, uh, the first couple weeks of September into mid-September. So September 11th is the peak of the hurricane season, and then you notice the rapid decline, especially after October 20th. Um, it generally really drops off drastically, uh, especially in November, and then once we get to December, uh, it's almost non-existent for the number of storms. Taking a look now at the overall, uh, what happens with the overall circulation, the vertical circulation with hurricanes. Uh, again, notice there's a there's an H that represents upper level high pressure that's aloft over the system. And then there's a, a red L there above the water at the top portion of this diagram that represents your surface low pressure system. So you notice in the center of the storm itself, that red arrow indicates downward moving air, sinking air motion. You'll have clear to partly cloudy skies in the eye. That is the result of why there's, why there's clear to partly cloudy skies in the eye is that sinking air motion with high pressure aloft generally flowing towards the low pressure at the surface and downward. Um, around that eye, however, the eye wall is where you get the tallest thunderstorms. It's where you get the strongest rising air motion. And then outward away from that even, you have rising air motions associated with those spiral rain bands. Okay? And then notice on the very edges of the, of the circulation in the vertical, you actually have sinking air motion. That's why typically before a major hurricane hits, it will be very eerie the day before a hurricane starts impacting an area. It's almost as if, you know, we use the expression, the calm before the storm. Well, that is due to the fact that the air is sinking. It's sinking um, out ahead of the hurricane and it's sinking after it passes. So usually the day before and the day after a hurricane, your weather will be really nice. Uh, you'll have you know, clear to partly cloudy skies, usually a lot of sunshine. Uh, unfortunately, uh, after the storm, a lot of the damage has already been done. So you'll see a lot of cleanup efforts in, in nice weather. Um, but anyway, that shows you the general vertical circulation associated with these storms. And then if you look at the bottom, showing you a uh, difference between surface air pressure and surface wind speed. And you'll notice that as towards the center of the hurricane, the eye, it has the lowest barometric pressure or surface air pressure. So you notice the biggest drop or dip, generally in association with the eye, okay? That's where your lowest barometric pressure is. The hurricane hunters, those planes that go out and, and do drop sounds, the special instruments that actually measure barometric pressure and a few other weather elements, they will get, you see the latest on hurricanes, that's where they get the central barometric pressure for the hurricane. And they usually express that in millibars. The surface wind speed was also going to drop off drastically where the pressure is the lowest. So you notice the bottom diagram here how the surface wind speed drops off drastically in the eye. So again, very light winds, clear to partly cloudy skies in the eye, and then the winds ramp up really quickly on both sides of the eye in that eye wall. That's where you have your strongest wind speeds and the most damage. Now, as far as the storm dying out, what causes a hurricane to weaken? A couple things here. Hurricanes weaken rapidly when they travel over colder water. Why? Because they use that warm ocean water as their heat source. Typically you want water temperatures 79 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. Um, so when, you lose your, when they lose their heat source, the hurricanes, over colder water, um, then it's generally going to cause a weakening trend. Also, if hurricanes move over land, they lose that warm water source as well, that heat source. So hurricanes can weaken rapidly, either moving over colder water or over land. Uh, the hurricane stages of development, you typically get uh, initially what's known as a tropical disturbance. Um, that's just an area of thunderstorms, not really organized yet. Uh, tropical depression, if the, if the disturbance continues to get better organized, you get a tropical depression. And that has wind speeds between 20 and 34 knots. Now, a tropical system gets named once it hits the tropical storm strength. Once it hits tropical storm strength, 
Um, 35 to 63 knot winds sustained, which means average winds, not gusts. Um, then you actually get a name for, for a, a tropical system when it hits tropical storm category, 35 to 63 knots. And then a hurricane has winds uh, 64, basically uh, 64 knots or greater. All right, in this image, I'm showing you a satellite uh, satellite picture. Uh, this is over the eastern North Pacific, uh, where you have a hurricane. Uh, you have Daniel, and then right behind Daniel have Amelia. And there's an investigation area behind Amelia off the coast of uh, Central America. Um, so what I'm getting at here with this image is that you can have multiple hurricanes going on at the same time. In fact during the very busy season of 2005 that was quite common to have three to even four hurricanes sitting out over the North Atlantic Ocean at one time so it is possible to have multiple storms going on right so as far as investigating the storm how do we gather data about a storm okay well satellite imagery has been a huge saving grace um, back in the Galveston hurricane of 1900 there was no satellite imagery. In fact, weather satellite imagery really didn't come into play until the 1960s. So you can imagine um, in the early 1900s when there was no satellite imagery over the remote locations of the ocean, how difficult it must have been to figure out that there was a hurricane out there and it was moving towards the United States. But today we are blessed with a lot of great technology, a lot of great weather tools, including visible infrared, enhanced uh, infrared satellite images so we our go satellites we can see over the remote locations of the oceans see how the cloud patterns are looking determining if something is trying to develop well in advance before impacting any landfall making any impacts to the landfall anywhere we also have hurricane hunter planes you know there's some that are located uh, some of the hurricane hunter planes are located out of Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi um, so there's a combination of two different types of planes that are used. Uh, there's typically like a C-130 plane that the Air Force uses to go out. Uh, there have been the uses of other types of military planes too. Uh, in addition, we also have uh, Gulfstream. Gulfstream planes that go out with scientific instrumentation. The bottom line here is, is that these hurricane hunters make a pass. They, they fly over the top of these hurricanes and you can imagine how turbulent that plane ride must be but uh, they have an instrument known as a drop sound which contains information uh, when they drop it into the storm they drop it out of the plane into the storm and then it descends through the storm it's going to give information such as the barometric pressure it's going to give information such as the wind speeds at multiple levels not just at the surface uh, of the ocean but also well above the storm uh, it's going to give you uh, a lot of great data on the, you know, where's the storm moving? They'll be taking fixes from the plane to determine what direction is the storm moving, what speed is the storm moving, uh, barometric pressure, winds, everything. So this instrumentation known as a radio sound, uh, actually a drop sound, a drop sound is a very handy piece of instrumentation that hurricane hunters use. Hurricane movement. In the northern hemisphere, hurricanes generally take on uh, movements towards the west, towards the northwest, towards the north, and then towards the northeast. But this can vary considerably because of various pressure systems steering hurricanes. In this example, I'm showing you uh, just a three-dimensional side view. This is precipitation intensity. Um, if a hurricane hunter were to fly through the storm on this track, this is what they would come up with. In this case, the uh, intensity is greatest. This looks like it's over Central America, the Yucatan. This is the Yucatan Peninsula area uh, of, around Central America. And it's showing the highest precipitation intensity in the red colors. In those red colors, and that is showing, uh, that's showing right around the center of the storm. It's around the, it's in the eye wall area. Here are some uh, past tracks of some notable storms. Um, this is just some examples of how crazy these storms can move, the different direction changes. Uh, very rarely do you have one solid straight line uh, from the open ocean waters to landfall. Usually there'll be a lot of uh, moving around and hurricanes have even been known to do loops out of the water. So these things are very unpredictable 
as far as their movement goes. Um, the general numerical weather models, though, have got much better. We talked about the weather forecasting section a couple lessons ago about numerical weather models. The numerical weather models have got much more accurate as far as uh, tracks. However, the intensity is a really uh, big issue still, and so there's a lot of research being done right now to help try to examine the, uh, the intensity. But tracks can take on a wide variety of patterns. They don't just, it's not just one straight line. All right, here is an example of uh, a tropical system in the southern hemisphere, and this is right off the coast of Brazil. Just remember uh, one thing about uh, southern hemisphere storms, any southern hemisphere cyclone, is going to rotate, the winds are going to flow around it clockwise around a cyclone. You know, our flow around cyclones in the northern hemisphere is counterclockwise. So you notice in this image in the southern hemisphere there uh, how the pattern, uh, the shape of the hurricane, you have a well-defined eye in the center, which is your clear area, but you also have a almost like a different spiraling shape. If I were to compare this to a northern hemisphere a hurricane and put them side by side, you would see the different cloud pattern um, being that this in the southern hemisphere is going to spin, the winds are going to flow around it in a clockwise manner. All right, so North Atlantic hurricanes in general, if we talk about them, uh, they generally form over the tropical North Atlantic and they move westward or northwestward, typically on a collision course with either Central or North America, the United States. Most hurricanes swing away from land and move northward parallel to the U.S. coastline. Um, so what really steers the North Atlantic hurricanes is a high pressure system known as the Bermuda or Azores High. And there's a clockwise flow, remember, in the Northern Hemisphere around high pressure systems. And I'll show you the track, uh, track slide here in a minute. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that steering mechanism, the Bermuda or Azores High. Uh, Eastern Pacific hurricanes generally form off the coast of Mexico over the Northeast Pacific. And here are all the historical tracks of hurricanes, and they're represented by these white lines. And you can see there is a lot of variation in the directions that these things have gone over the years. Um, you can see that the United States, especially the southeast coast, has been hit quite frequently or has had some really near misses. Uh, also, there's been quite a, few, quite a lot of activity in the Gulf of Mexico, into the Gulf Coast states. Uh, Florida as a peninsula. Um, you know, we even have had some notable storms up in New England. For example, Hurricane Bob back in 1991. Hurricane Bob, take a look at that sometime if you're interested. Uh, that one made it all the way up into New England, into the Massachusetts area. It held together long enough, despite moving over the colder North Atlantic waters, it still maintained its hurricane intensity upon coming into landfall in Massachusetts. So hurricanes can occur anywhere along the Gulf Coast states, and anywhere along the East Coast from Florida all the way up to New England, you cannot rule out the possibility of these systems impacting those areas. And then hurricane formation and dissipation continuing, our last slide on this topic. Really, the storms in the North Atlantic, if you noticed uh, where the hurricane development is most likely, first of all, it's in the red colors is where hurricane formation is most likely. And that really is dependent on the time of year. If you look at the top image, that's an August image. Um, so you get tropical systems in August and September that generally form further out in the Atlantic Ocean uh, compared to October and November, where you get tropical systems that generally form closer into the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, uh, also off the southeast coast of the United States over the warm Gulf Stream waters. So the formation location, the most likely locations for hurricanes to form, that will vary by the time of year. And I want you to pay attention to the arrows before I move on to the next slide. See how the arrows, sometimes these systems form over, over the Atlantic and then they make that curve to the northeast. And that is, again, mainly due to the fact that you have a Bermuda high pressure system sitting over the Atlantic Ocean. And the clockwise flow around that high generally steers these systems towards the United States East Coast. But if that high were to slide just a little bit or relocate a little bit to the east, it could actually cause a storm to move up along the east coast, but not really make landfall. Um, Cape Hatteras is one of those locations in North Carolina that gets a lot of close calls, or sometimes you get the hurricanes that move over Cape Hatteras, and then they move northeast out over out to sea. Naming hurricanes and tropical storms, that process has changed over the years. 
Uh, we used to use latitude and longitude to specifically identify tropical systems of the past, the hurricanes of the past. Uh, letters of the alphabet have been used even. Uh, initially, back during World War I, we were using alphabetical female names only, and then we decided to alternate between female and male names alphabetically. And if we run out of the letters A through Z on the traditional alphabet, we then revert and use the Greek alphabet. And this has actually happened. It happened during the busy hurricane season of 2005. There were so many storms that the hurricane center ran out of A through Z on the regular alphabet, and they had to use the Greek alphabet to continue with the naming. Now, as far as the impacts of hurricanes, these are devastating storms. Uh, Hurricane Katrina comes to mind right away. Uh, hurricane approaching from the south, your highest winds are going to be on the eastern side. Okay, so I want you to remember one thing with hurricanes. The dangerous semicircle is on the eastern side of hurricanes in the northern hemisphere. You have the strongest winds on the eastern side. They, call the high, they cause the highest storm surge and the most damage. So remember that the eastern semicircle of a hurricane is the most dangerous side of the storm. That is usually the side of the storm you want to avoid, if at all possible. Flooding and storm surge is very likely with hurricanes making landfall. Storm surge and flooding, these are two of the most deadly aspects of a hurricane. <clears throat> with, with storm surges, what's happening is you have such low barometric pressure at the center of hurricanes that it literally draws up the ocean levels like a if you were to drink out of a straw. And when you drink out of the straw, how you suck the water up through the straw, the same thing is happening at the center of a hurricane. The lowest barometric pressure um, is generally causing, it's almost like acting like a suction force. It's causing the ocean levels to rise above, uh, way above normal. It creates a what's known as a storm surge. And as a hurricane makes its approach to the land, it's going to basically move this huge wall of water onto the shore as a hurricane comes in. So it could be a lot of flooding, not only due to that storm surge near coastal areas, but also a lot of flooding just due to heavy, heavy rainfall. Um, these systems can produce on the order of 20 inches plus of rain. We've see it, we saw it last year in 2017 with Harvey in the Houston, Texas area. That was not even a, you know, Full, very strong hurricane at the time of landfall, um, but the steering, steering currents were so weak that there was nothing pushing that storm out of the way, and it just sat over the eastern Texas for so long and dumped so much rainfall there. Catastrophic flooding in the Houston, Texas area um, with Harvey last year. And then classifying hurricane strength, how do we classify how strong these things are? We use what's known as a Saffir-Simpson hurricane scale with category one being the weakest and category five being the strongest. Looking at some of the impacts here, um, lots of rainfall associated with hurricanes. There's just devastating flooding. Um, you generally have on the eastern side, the eastern semicircle is the most dangerous side of the storm. Um, that's mainly due to the fact that you have the forward momentum or motion of the storm in addition to the winds wrapping around counterclockwise. So the eastern side or the east semicircle, the right semicircle is the worst part of the storm. In this case, we're showing you a hurricane moving northward at 25 knots. You'll notice on the left side of the hurricane, the west side of it, you have 75 knot winds, but on the east side, you have 125 knot winds. So if I were to take the wind strength plus the motion, the forward motion of the storm and add those up, that gives me 125 knot winds on that eastern side. So that, that is a very deadly part of the storm. Here's an example of storm surge and its impacts. Um, so for example, if you have you know, these structures there built along the beach and mean sea level is the bottom dash line, a high, tides, high tide maybe you get two feet above that normal mean sea level along a beach, but a storm surge, that can bring up up to 15 feet of water in from the ocean, crashing on over land, over the coastal areas, and just be devastating. And then you may have 10 foot waves above that on top of the storm surge. So there's a lot of deadly impacts of storm surge. Uh, basically storm surge is just an abnormal rise 
in the water levels as a hurricane moves in. Here's an example of, this is the table in your book. It's a Saffir-Simpson hurricane wind scale. Notice category one on this scale is the weakest hurricane. And then category five is the strongest hurricane. Uh, you can see that we break down the winds in both miles per hour and knots. And then the summary, what is the summary that is a result of this kind of impact of winds? Um, you can see what's going on here. It's a wind scale. If you get up to category five, winds in excess of 136 knots or 156 miles per hour, you're looking at catastrophic wind damage. Devastating wind, storm surge and flooding continued. If you look at this, this is a, uh, this is a graphic of the rainfall amounts for a past hurricane. Uh, I believe this is Irene. This might be Hurricane Irene of 2011. It looks like it's the track. Uh, but generally, it moved just parallel to the East Coast. It didn't quite go into land until up in New Jersey, just to the west of New York City. In fact, Irene, uh, they were really worried about this flooding the subway systems in New York City. And it made a really close call with the United States East Coast. If you look at the rainfall amounts over North Carolina, you're looking upwards at 15 to 20 inches of rain. That purple shading is up to 15 inches of rain. 10 inches is the blue shading. So you can see how heavy of a rain swath this created all the way up the coast as Irene moved up the East Coast. Here is an example of how the different water levels appear based on the categories of a hurricane. Uh, normal high tide is the image on the far left. And then as we move from left to right, uh, the second picture there shows what the water levels would be like with the storm surge and tide high tide. Um, generally a category one you have a four foot rise. Uh, category three a 12 foot rise. That is significant from cat one to cat three. And then all the way up to cat five. You can have a 20 foot rise in water. You have no beach visible. Uh, that building there, it's a three story building. And look on the right hand picture there. A category five, if the water level rises 20 feet, it submerges both the first and second floors of this building. Just incredible uh, what can happen with these systems. In this particular image, I'm showing the uh, general intensities and the number of hurricanes. Uh, the number of hurricanes is on the y-axis. When I say y-axis, think the vertical. Uh, it ranges from 0 to 80 on the y-axis and the vertical on the left part of the diagram. That's the number of hurricanes. And then the bottom, the x-axis, the horizontal axis in the very bottom, goes from category 1 to category 5 storms. So if you notice, uh, the majority, 77 of the storms over the past 100 years, 77 of the hurricanes have been Category 1 strength. 45 have been Category 2 strength. 53 have been Category 3 strength. And then you notice Category 4 and 5, the number of hurricanes drops off drastically. 13 hurricanes for a category four and there were only three hurricanes for a category five. So as the intensity increases, the number of hurricanes will drop off drastically, but it only takes you know, one category four, or one category five, and you are looking at catastrophic damage. Another threat from these, from these systems from hurricanes are what's known as hurricane spawn tornadoes. Did you know about one-fourth or one-quarter of the hurricanes that strike the U.S. produce tornadoes? And considerable damage can, can occur with these tornadoes. The, the real trick to these uh, hurricane spawn tornadoes is they're usually rain-wrapped. The rain is coming down so hard that it's very difficult to see them. Um, unlike the Central Plains tornadoes where you can see them, um, these, these tornadoes can be very quick moving and be on top of you and you may not even be able to see them out your window because the rain is coming down so heavy in one of the rain, rain bands. Um, generally, hurricane spawn tornadoes occur in the northeast quadrant of hurricanes, landfalling hurricanes, uh, where you have the greatest amount of wind energy and then you have a lot of wind shear. Hurricane fatalities up until 2005, up through 2005, the annual death toll from U.S. hurricanes over a span of about 30 years. So we're going back from 2005, we're going back 30 years. 
average the number of deaths average fewer than 50 persons so again thanks to our technology especially our weather satellite imagery that allows us to plan for these type of storms well in advance uh, we can see them over the oceans the numerical weather prediction has improved drastically especially in regards to track hurricane katrina that one caused quite a few fatalities uh, as as we're well aware but overall the number of deaths 50 50 uh, average fewer than 50 persons over the last 30 years from 2005 going back 30 years you know it could be a lot worse but again that technology is is a blessing for all of us here are some notable hurricanes i, I already mentioned the galveston 1900 hurricane that killed 6,000 people the problem with that one is is there was no seawall at the time over galveston in texas um so after the 1900 hurricane in galveston that killed 6,000 people and, and again this one was a very difficult one if you ever want a real interesting book to read about that hurricane uh, of 1900 in galveston take a look at isaac storm i highly recommend that book it's a really good book it's called isaac's storm it kind of explains isaac is a meteorologist it works out of the galveston national weather service forecast office and it kind of it, it really elaborates and explains how difficult it was to see a hurricane coming back in 1900 when we didn't have any weather satellites um, after the Galveston uh, disaster of 1900 with that hurricane, they decided to build a big seawall, and it's still there to this day. They have a big, tall seawall now to kind of keep the waves at bay so they don't have a complete inundation from storm surge into Galveston anymore. Uh, the, the hurricane of 1938 in New England, I did mention Hurricane Bob in 1991, but there's also what's known as a Long Island Express of 1938 for New England. It impacted... New England states, uh, they called the Long Island Express because it moved so rapidly. If you Google Long Island Express of 1938, you're going you're gonna to run into the interesting facts about that hurricane. Hurricane Camille, 1969, southern Mississippi, yeah, just got hit so hard. Um, they actually classified that as a Category 5 hurricane. Just unbelievable damage. Up until Hurricane Katrina, uh, that was the talk of... Uh, many of the southern Mississippi uh, cities, such as Biloxi and uh, Gulfport, Mississippi. Hurricane Hugo 1989 came into uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and that was a very intense system. Uh, I believe it was a Cat 4. Uh, it might have been a Cat low and Cat 5 even, but it did just tremendous damage in Charleston, South Carolina. Hurricane Andrew 1992, it actually made two landfalls. The first landfall is a Category 5 into around the Miami, Florida area, completely leveled and did um, serious damage to Homestead Air Force Base in South Florida. Hurricane Ivan of 2004, um, some of you may be familiar with this one. Uh, Ivan, I believe that was a Gulf Coast uh, system there. And then Katrina and Rita in 2005. Katrina, we're very familiar with Katrina. Uh, all the crazy, crazy damage that that one occurred, especially in South Mississippi and Louisiana. With the levees breaking in Louisiana, that just exasperated the situation there. And then Sandy. Sandy's an interesting storm in 2012 because it started out as a hurricane, and then it made a crazy left hook or a left-hand turn against the normal. Normally, storms will basically move northeast out to sea, but in this case, Sandy made a left turn westward into uh, New Jersey, and they just got hit very hard by Sandy when, it came, when she came in. It may landfall. Here is an example. This image here is showing you Hurricane Hugo. And I said Hurricane Hugo of 1989. This thing came into Charleston, South Carolina, made landfall there, and it did a lot of damage. Take a look at Hurricane uh, Hugo if you get a chance. Take a look at those stats. Uh, this example is from, this is Hurricane Andrew as it was making landfall into South Florida in 1992. The maroon colors there, they generally indicate the eye wall and you can see how solid this eye wall is there is there is no break in it it's a complete concentric circle in the center uh just inward from the eye wall the maroon colors is the actual eye the eye itself this is what some of the damage can be like after a hurricane i mean you've seen it in the news i'm sure plenty of times uh, but this is just nothing to mess around with uh, unfortunately you know, we have a lot of a lot of population along our waters and 
the population has increased over the years despite these dangers and, and these threats by hurricanes. Um, so the dollar amount of the storms will just continue to rise due to our, our uh, wanting to live on a coastline near an ocean, near water. Everybody wants to live on water. They want to be able to go outside, out their back, and, and perhaps be on the beach and hear the ocean waves. But these are the risks with living along the water. This is the uh, eye of Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. Very intense system, obviously caused catastrophic damage New Orleans into South Mississippi. Um, I lived in South Mississippi before Katrina, and I'd come back to South Mississippi after Katrina, and I will tell you from experience that is that was quite a change. Um, before I left Highway 90, have you ever been to Biloxi? If you go west on Interstate 10 from Pensacola, go towards Biloxi. If you ever go there, you know, there's a, there's a lot of casinos on the water. There's a lot of restaurants and establishments on the water before Katrina. When I came back uh, after Katrina, it was completely dark. It was such an eerie, eerie feeling going down Highway 90 along the water there between Gulfport and Biloxi, and there was just nothing there. It was completely dark. The rebuilding process was, was going on, and it was just really strange. Here is the uh, New Orleans area after the levees had been breached. Um, generally, the, east, the eastern side of the city got it the worst. Uh, a lot of the water just spilled in. You know, Some of these ramps off the interstate are completely underwater. Parts of the interstate are completely underwater. Just an epic disaster for the United States as a whole. Uh, Hurricane Katrina. And then this is showing you uh, just an overall wind field. These arrows represent the wind directions. They're like wind vectors. And, and the uh, colors themselves represent wind speed in miles per hour. Uh, just showing you that you know, with hurricanes, the eye wall has the highest winds, but do keep in mind that you can have tropical storm force winds can extend easily outward away from the center of a hurricane out to 200 miles easily. So just because you may not be directly impacted by a storm with a direct landfall or with the eye overhead, you can still get some very strong winds further outward away from the center of these systems. This track, the dash line, this is, this is sandy. Started out as a hurricane off the southeast, uh, was moving up the southeast coast, and then made a left-hand turn into New Jersey and just damaged unbelievable amounts of things in New Jersey. Uh, go ahead and take a look at that. Hurricane Sandy, and then it transitioned to an extra tropical cyclone, and uh, it was just a disaster. Here's an example of what Sandy had left. This is on the New Jersey coastline. I mean, look at that. Half that house is gone just from the wave action and the winds. Unbelievable what, what kind of damage can be done. Now, as far as devastating tropical cyclones around the world, some of the more notable ones, you know, we, we're not just limited to the damage here in the United States. You have tropical cyclones in the Indian Ocean. You have typhoons in the Western Pacific Ocean. So you have tropical cyclones into Australia, the northern part of Australia, the equatorial part of Australia. So these, these storms are all over the globe. It's not just isolated to the North Atlantic or the East Pacific. A um, couple of the more notable ones, tropical cyclone in Bangladesh, 1970. That was a big, big storm. And if I remember right in the numbers, over 300,000 people got killed from that one. Tropical cyclone Sitter, tropical cyclone Nargis, and super typhoon Haiyan. Take a look at Super Typhoon Haiyan. You know, I was out in Guam for a while. Occasionally, I would go out to Guam, and wow, they have literally been hit multiple times out in the Marianas Islands by these typhoons, and these systems really intensify. I've been on a ship out in the Western Pacific Ocean as well, and you know, you really got to dodge these typhoons, these tropical systems, because they pop up all over the place. And so, you got to be careful when you're out on ships that you don't put the ship in dangerous harm. But uh, Super Typhoon Haiyan, I'll tell you what, what's interesting is, is when I went to Guam, uh, what was interesting is, is they actually have uh, buildings that are able to withstand or sustain up to 150 mile per hour winds. Um, they have special buildings that are designed to be almost like ready rooms or safe shelters that can withstand winds up to 150 miles per hour. If that's not saying something, I don't know what is. Um, deadliest hurricanes were the great hurricane of 1780 and then Hurricane Mitch. 
Hurricane Mitch went into Central America, but here's the thing. There's a lot of mountainous terrain in Central America, so when all that tropical moisture with Hurricane Mitch as it moved in, all that tropical moisture ran into the higher elevation of those mountains. It basically, as that moisture hit the mountains, it dumped even worse, and all that rain came pouring down the hills. A lot of landslides, a lot of mudslides resulted, and a lot of people died due to that deadly flooding caused by Hurricane Mitch in the higher terrain of Central America. All right, so we're going to wrap up the lesson today on hurricanes. We're going to talk about the differences between a hurricane watch, a hurricane warning. Watch, hurricane watch is issued 24 to 48 hours before a storm arrives. Okay, so it gives people a little more of a heads up for planning purposes. Start making your storm preparations now, basically. While hurricane warning is issued when it becomes more certain that the storm will strike an area. And the warning is designed to give residents ample time to secure property and, if necessary, to evacuate. So uh, a warning basically means that hurricane conditions are coming soon, whereas a watch is those hurricane conditions are possible 24 to 40 hours before the storm arrives. As far as forecasting techniques go here on the last couple slides of the lesson, numerical weather prediction models, this, along with the weather satellite, have been just blessings for hurricane prediction. Um, what is numerical weather prediction models? We kind of talked about it in the weather forecasting section a couple lessons ago. I think it was the week nine video. The computer models that represent the hurricane and its environment in a greatly simplified manner. So these computer models take that hurricane, simplify it, uh, information from satellites. You know, we look at that all the time over those remote ocean areas. What about ocean buoys? We do have buoys that are sitting out over the waters of the ocean areas, especially along coastal areas that give us barometric pressure, wave height, winds, wind speed and direction. So those are very handy tools and it's kind of telling us what's going on with hurricanes. And then reconnaissance aircraft, all this information, satellite buoys and the reconnaissance aircraft, those are those hurricane hunter planes, that's all fed into the computer models to help really give a more accurate forecast for the hurricane. Where is it going and what kind of intensity can we expect? Dynamical models may take into account the depth of warm ocean water in front of the storm's path to predict the storm's intensity as well. Just keep in mind that the warmer the ocean waters become, the greater the intensity of the hurricane because that's exactly what the hurricane is feeding off of is warmer ocean waters. So if you have above normal sea surface temperatures, for example, ahead of a hurricane, there's a good chance that hurricane is going to intensify or get stronger. When we tried, you know, we knew the dangers of hurricanes a long while back. And the U.S. government actually sponsored what was known as Project Storm Fury of the 1950s. And the overall idea behind Project Storm Fury was to weaken hurricanes out over the open waters of the Atlantic. So how do we weaken hurricanes? Well, what the government tried to do is it had planes sent planes out over the hurricanes, over the waters. And these planes dropped this silver iodide, this dry ice, into the hurricane. And what it did is it seeds the clouds to create rain. It basically, the silver iodide or dry ice acts as nuclei for all that liquid to attach itself to, all that rain in the hurricane to attach itself to, the droplets, and rain itself out. That was the hope. Uh, weaken the hurricane, rain itself out, and then reduce the winds. That was the whole idea of cloud seeding. Cloud seeding is a very interesting topic if you ever get a chance to take a look. Um, there are some good, uh, good articles out there on cloud seeding. Not to mention that when you do drop cloud, uh, silver iodide or dry ice in the clouds, you will notice evaporation of moisture. That actually has been proof that it will cause holes in the clouds. Uh, but there's no conclusive evidence of effectiveness. So... The U.S. government quit, quit funding this project after a certain point in time. Uh, it felt like it wasn't working, but we have tried to modify the weather through uh, dropping silver iodide and dry ice into hurricanes as an example. Oil or film on water, this is placed to reduce evaporation and latent heat available to storms. Uh, not yet proven effective. So we are still trying to modify hurricanes and even modify precipitation patterns. But that's a whole other topic. We talk about cloud seeding, but it's a very intriguing topic at that.
So in summary, on today's lesson, hurricanes are tropical cyclones. They have sustained winds of at least 64 knots blowing counterclockwise and inward toward the center of a hurricane, toward the center of the low pressure in the northern hemisphere. Hurricanes consist of a mass of organized thunderstorms that spiral in toward the low pressure or the eye. The center of a hurricane is called the eye. Remember that that's the area where the air is sinking. As the air sinks, it compresses, it warms, and it dries out. So typically in the eye, you have clear to partly cloudy conditions, and your barometric pressure will be at its lowest point. Your wind speeds will be at their lowest point as well. The eye wall was that very intense ring of thunderstorms that immediately surrounds the eye. The eye wall is the most intense portion of the hurricane. And it has the heaviest rain bands, has the highest, strongest, most damaging wind gusts. And then as you move further out away from the eye wall uh, into the spiral rain bands, you kind of get rain that starts and stops quickly. And you can get strong wind gusts uh, also associated with the spiral rain bands. Now, hurricanes are born over warm tropical waters where the air is humid, surface winds are converging or coming together, and thunderstorms become organized. And hurricanes, of course, can inflict a great deal of damage. Um, two of the biggest threats with hurricanes, the, the most damage and deaths occur associated with storm surge as well as flooding. All right, that wraps things up for the lesson on hurricanes. Week 11 meteorology video on hurricanes, chapter 11 in your books. Um, please feel free to ask questions if, if you don't understand something. Keep working hard. Uh, we're getting towards the end of the semester. I hope everybody enjoyed this presentation on hurricanes. I hope this interests you and it, it definitely will uh, prompt you to go do more research, further research about hurricanes. They're very interesting storms. All right, everybody have a great day. Take care and we'll talk to you again soon.